how many should come. So thank you very much uh, to join us today for this webinar. Uh, this webinar is called Solar Heating, How Can Cities Decarbonize Their District Heating System? So it's the second uh, session uh, after uh, the first session we had three weeks ago. Uh, so it's about how to integrate solar heating to decarbonize a uh, district heating uh, system. Um, as you know, there is a clear need to accelerate the decarbonization of the heating and cooling supply. Uh, here you can see the increase of the share of renewable energy in the heating and cooling consumption for the different EU member states. Um, and you see that the increase, uh, average increase during the period 2015-2019 were below uh, the threshold of 1.1 percentage point. Uh, which is the um, EU target. Uh, and for the most of the countries, in fact, uh, the increase of the share of renewable in heating and cooling consumption is uh, below this target, um, especially for the biggest, uh, I mean, the member states with the biggest uh, heating and cooling consumption. Uh, so there is a clear need to accelerate. We have seen during the first webinars, uh, but uh, well, solar heating and cooling can uh, support a lot of uh, target of cities. Of course, it helps to decarbonize uh, heating and cooling supply, uh, but it's not only that, it's also increasing the energy security uh, because solar heat is, of course, a local uh, resources which is available. Um, it's keep the heat affordable uh, with a stable price for uh, 20 years, but also it support the local economy and create local jobs. Um, so we have published an article and uh, also uh, um, the webinar recording is available on the Covenant website, so feel free to uh, look at it if you were not with us uh, during the first webinar. Today, uh, the idea is to go a bit uh, deeper in uh, on the on the topic uh, during the first webinar we had an overall presentation of uh, heating and cooling technologies and also two great examples of uh, solar plants already developed and working in Latvia and in Austria and today uh, we'll have an overview of what's going on in other countries and uh, address some more technical topic so for the first presentation uh, Magdalena Berberich, uh, who is Deputy Director of Solites and also one of the subtask leaders um, of the International Energy Agency Solar Heating and Cooling Task 68, will uh, speak mostly about uh, the planning process and tendering process of solar district heating. Uh, then we'll move more to on the technical aspect with a presentation from Daniel Trier, uh, with Solar Energy Team Leader at Plan Energy, uh, a company from Denmark. And then uh, Luc Burskens will uh, speak more about the economic aspect of uh, solar thermal energy and is working at TNO in the Netherlands and also one of the subtask uh, leader within uh, the International Energy Agency Task 68. So thank you uh, already to our three speakers, speakers joining us today to share their insight. Uh, so we'll start with the presentation of Magdalena. So Magdalena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I will share my screen now. So you should see my presentation in the full screen mode. Yes. Um, yes. Um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Julia. Um, yes, my name is Magdalena Berberich, uh, working at Solitas. We are a research institute in Germany, located in Stuttgart. And uh, our main topics are the um, big or large scale solar thermal plants um, um, in district heating networks and um, large scale um, also uh, thermal heat storages and um, yeah and and uh, geothermal energy systems um, and we are um, deal already with um, 
systems, which uh, which has the goal to reduce the CO2 emissions. So that's also our goal now today um, to see how it's possible to reduce CO2 emissions and uh, to have smart systems um, in the future with solar heating and district heating. Um, for our motivation, uh, why should we start now with these topics? Um, we have in, in most European countries and uh, especially in Germany, there is um, the goal to have a climate neutral building stock in 2045. And um, we have also the public pressure for these uh, topics. So we should start now to have um, the buildings which are constructed now, that they are um, in 2045 in the in the best position to to contribute to the um, uh, low carbon emissions um, because they are constructed now and they will uh, keep like they are until uh, 2045. And also the heating plants which are built in district heating, uh, they remain um, with their technology um, until 2045 or even longer. So it's it's really necessary to uh, start now with uh, changing the technologies um, so that uh, they can then contribute to a, um, to a climate neutral building stock. Um, yes, maybe before a remark, um, I, I speak uh, in some points, um, especially for Germany, because we have the uh, references and uh, the experience there. Um, but it's in, in a lot of uh, topics, it's also um, good transferable to other European countries. Um, yes, in Germany, uh, there is the obligation um, for local heat planning in some of the regions already. And in the national law, it's expected um, to come this year um, for cities with 10,000 to 20,000 inhabitants, uh, which are larger than this. And um, there in, in this uh, heat uh, planning, it's necessary to have suggestions for refurbishment um, of buildings for areas for district heating and also for uh, single house solutions. And there's also subsidies uh, for this program. Um, as a second step, they have a, a subsidy program called BEW, um, Bundesförderung Effiziente Wärmenetze. So the subsidy for efficient district heating and there are feasibility studies um, subsidies for 50% and the realization of um, projects are with 40% um, of subsidies. Um, yes, and there's also a good uh, subsidy in, in the operation. Uh, you have uh, one euro cent per kilowatt hours um, for solar thermal plants, for example, um, which you get in the operation for the first 10 years. So it's very interesting now. Um, it's uh, running on, uh, from um, autumn last year, and it's a very interesting program for, uh, for Germany. Um, another discussion is now uh, a new national law um, for heated houses. Um, to reach 65% of renewable share in single houses and um, or to get connected to district heating. This is in its discussion to have um, uh, op obligable um, now um, from this year. Um, and it's uh, then necessary to make it a transition plan for district heating. Um, and then to follow this plan, so not just to make a plan which is uh, then um, not not uh, followed uh, afterwards, but uh, here it's really um, the obligation to follow this plan. And this will then um, uh, this will be necessary for other district heating systems if if this law uh, comes. So what can you expect uh, from different renewable energies? Um, how, uh, which which um, technology is best if you have a, an area. Um, 
for solar thermal and photovoltaics and biomass, I have a, um, a small comparison here. Um, so per square meter land, which is um, maybe more interesting um, for you, it's 200 to 250 kilowatt hours per year, which you can expect from solar thermal plants um, constructed on, on a free area. Um, and if you have photovoltaics installed, it's 50 to 75 kilowatt hours per year. And for biomass, it's just four to five kilowatt hours per year. So um, I don't want to say that uh, one technology is better than the other, but um, it's necessary to know what can you expect. And if you have an area and if you have the heat demand, um, it um, makes sense to, um, yeah, to, to see what solar thermal can contribute here to your system. But um, of course, for solar thermal, you um, need to have an area which is very close to your um, heat demand. Um, we say as a rule of thumb that um, for each 10,000 uh, square meters of uh, solar thermal, um, you can um, have a distance of around uh, one kilometer. Um, which is away from, from your heat demand. Um, but of course, this needs to be um, uh, seen in the, in the detailed plan or, or in the simulation. How much area do you need if you uh, decided for SDH? Um, the solar heat um, you can gain from one hectare um, can meet 20% of the total annual heat demand from 1,000 households living in old buildings. And uh, compared with other um, areas, typical areas for, for a city or for a, a community, you have here uh, 0 0.7 hectares if you uh, have a soccer field or um, 0 0.5 hectares if you, if you build a supermarket. So it's not so much more, and you can uh, then have 20% of your heat demand um, uh, contributed by solar thermal. Um, it's necessary to know how, um, how much uh, solar thermal um, energy can you get from your area. And um, for each square meter collector area, you need um, um, almost or around uh, two times the area of land. So um, if you search for areas, you need to keep that in mind. And here are some, some examples from, uh, from collector areas which are already installed. So now, what is uh, the interesting question for this um, presentation today? How to find now the areas? and um, how to find areas near the heat demand. Um, it's in each project, it's a risk, and it's one of the, of the biggest uh, risks why a project is, is kit in the end. So, um, and it's often a long process. So it's a very important topic. Um, what is recommended here is to have a good communication from the beginning between the utilities or the investors and the local authorities, um, because just then you can find solutions which are uh, good for both sides. Um, then you should uh, start a structured analysis of all possible areas. Um, and if you have additional areas, it's better to keep them in mind and uh, not to focus just on one area because uh, maybe there are other projects waiting or you need an area for uh, uh, thermal energy storage or you need um, something for future projects. So um, uh, investigate on, on all the areas you can and then um, you can uh, choose the best uh, fitting area. Um, in Germany, there's also a discussion um, how to integrate areas um, for solar thermal in the regional planning, um, which uh, would make the permis permissions um, uh, much more easier and faster. Um, but this is a special case here. 
Um, I have here uh, an example from uh, the city of Ludwigsburg. In the um, left picture, you see um, how the collectors are installed on the ground. It's a very fast process. And um, on the right side, you see how the, the two collector areas are installed on, on the area here near the city. And there's a specialty um, here in Ludwigsburg because it's um, the two areas are located on different municipalities. So the, the one um, on the upper side, it's near Ludwigsburg and the other one is in the neighbor municipality. And uh, this is uh, really um, an interesting case because um, it's it's very uh, difficult to to um, get the permission then, but it was possible because um, there was privileged land use in the building law, and so it was possible to to get these two areas here. So if you have an area and you want to install solar collectors, um, you can upgrade your area ecologically. And uh, that means um, with some uh, special measures, um, you can have a really uh, great biodiversity developing under your collector area on the ground. And um, municipalities even get um, eco points for solar thermal installation areas. So instead of buying uh, eco points like uh, in other constructions, here you get eco points. And if you make special measures um, for biodiversity, you can even get more um, eco points for this. Um, how is the project development um, of a large collector field? Um, it's the case that the um, heat output not only depends on the solar irradiation uh, locally, but um, you also need the system integration. So like, uh, do you install a heat storage or do you have other um, special um, uh, system technologies in your in your over, overall systems, heat pumps or um, uh, surplus heat or something like that. So you need to uh, to keep that uh, or to bring it into account. Uh, what what do you have uh, locally? And then um, the collector field should be dimensioned by a system simulation to um, yeah to investigate on on the special system um, which you have locally. Um, there are several market players available that deliver turnkey ready installations. Um, so they they can also give uh, good advice here. And um, of course you should have the land area available uh, in this stage. And um, there are in some countries uh, there are are special building permits necessary? Um, so, so you need to, as I said in the beginning, you need to communicate with the uh, local authority to see how, yeah, to to start the process of the permission and um, to see what is necessary there in your special case. For the tendering, it's often a, a functional specification uh, which you need. Um, in this turnkey ready market, and um, for each collector product, you has uh, you have special um, thermal characteristics. So um, it's really important that you um, that you have a comparable um, that that you can compare different uh, bits that you have, and. Um, here there is, uh, for example, one um, one calculation tool. It's called SCFW. It's in German, unfortunately, but maybe for some of you it's interesting. And um, if you say maybe with this one or another tool, the collector um, um, manufacturers or the, the bidders uh, should um, calculate their output so you can compare um, the different uh, bits. 
Here's an example um, in, in the south of Germany, Kilberg 4, Kilberg 4, and um, it's a new district. I just want to show you uh, one point about this. Um, here, the energy storage is will be built in an earth fill. So it's uh, it's in operation now, and the earth fill is um, uh, now filled up with earth so that the um, the hole for the storage is kept free. And um, this was a very interesting process to get the permission for this because it was an um, earth fill in, co in operation. But it was possible with, together with the city and um, the utilities. Um, so it's it's possible. I want to show you it's possible to um, to multi-use some areas. And um, to end my presentation, I just want to show you here a um, project of us, which is a German project. But uh, on this website, you see or you can can find some more information and contacts and uh, also a lot of documents about solar district heating. And on another um, European project, you find uh, a lot of information in English. Um, which is more um, general about district heating and um, with renewable energy sources and also context for this one. So um, now I thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, um, you can ask them now. Thank you, Magdalena, for this uh, presentation about the tips and tricks uh, for planning and tendering, and also this uh, explanation a bit more of the German context. Uh, there is already one uh, question, um, which is why do you need so much land for solar heat installations? I think it refers also to uh, your explanation that you said you need to have uh, twice uh, the size of the um, solar collectors uh, for for the size of your installation. So can you explain why uh, twice maybe? What are the other elements that you need to take into consideration? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I, I didn't uh, go into detail there. So um, yes, the, the solar collectors are installed in lines. So here are maybe two two solar collector, two two rows of solar collectors, and in between you need some distance because of the shading. If you don't have a distance, you have um, your shading from the first one to the other one, um, to the other row, and that's why you need some distance, and that's why you need um, more area to install the the collectors. Um, I hope that answers the question. I think so. Uh, there is another question from Werner, but Werner Langbauer. But the question is quite long. Maybe Werner, can you uh, just unmute yourself and explain a bit uh, your question? Um, I, I see the the first part of it. Um, I read already, and it was about um, why not use parabolic uh, mirror systems for heat generation. Um, yes, it's interesting. And in our uh, task 68, uh, we are working um, on this topic um, to also use not like standard collectors, um, like flat blade and um, vacuum tube collectors, but also to use um, concentrating collectors for uh, solar district heating. Um, but so far, they are more used in um, ships, so in, in industrial. Um, processes and um, there is not so much uh, experience now in district heating and that's why uh, we first need to um, yeah to to um, prepare the information for the market so that that it's more known and uh, that that it's also known how it's possible to use concentrating uh, collectors in district heating so we are in the beginning of this topic okay thanks um you mentioned one thing is that um for um let's take uh, a project um owner but a municipality in our case who would like to uh develop its uh own plant uh to decarbonize this system you you mentioned the fact that uh 
it's easier to have a tender based on a functional specification. Can you explain a bit more what it means, functional specification for you? Um, yes, it's, uh, it's um, not a detailed, um, uh, sorry, I need to go to the slide to see what was written. Yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, there are um, sometimes detailed tendering um, uh, documents, and in this case, it's it should be a, a functional description of the um, of the plant. So uh, there there must not be um, information like um, from each uh, screw or each um, pipe, um, but it's more functional description because the the turnkey um, um, market or, or the the current turnkey manufacturers they will give uh, the yeah the the information about the 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 details of the planning of the plant okay so more in terms of uh, temperature or maybe quantity of energy would like to mm -hmm. be delivered yes uh, there is one question about what type of energy meter generally installed with solar panel to measure the energy generated. Um, Sorry, what, what kind of? Um, of energy meter. Metering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, they are, there's a kind of uh, standard to um, you you need some measurement uh, for for the operation of the plant, um, but but I cannot uh, say one product or to to give information about um, special products. Um, but but you need uh, some um, measurement in in the solar uh, loop um, of of the plant, and also um, in the um, district heating uh, connection um, heating central. So that the the solar thermal is um, operated um, in an efficient way. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, usually the thermal meter, uh, I guess, with also like measurement of temperature and pressure, which allow mm -hmm. to, to calculate the, the heat delivered. Uh, there is another question, but it's more general. Yeah, maybe it's important to mention that we are speaking here again about solar thermal, so the output is the heat and not electricity, as mentioned yes. by, by Nid. Um, another question, uh, solar district heating versus heat pump powered by renewable energy. In your opinion, which one is more promising to allow more people having renewable, reliable heating service? Very broad questions. Yes. Um... Yeah, there there is no no general answer about it. Uh, I can can just say it depends on the system and and on your site you have on your areas. Um, for our goals to have a climate neutral uh, heating, um, we will in the end uh, need all the technologies. So, um, but with with which one you start now? Um, that depends on uh, how is your system uh, now and how how maybe uh, which sources do you have locally? Um, do you have um, a heat which you can um, bring with a heat pump out of a river or of a sea, a, a lake or something like that? Or can you use um, industrial excess, uh, in, industrial um, excess heat? Um, maybe with a heat pump. So um, yeah, you you need in the end you need all technologies, and um, it depends on on your uh, special um, boundary condition conditions. Yes. Yeah, so if I can add also on what I uh, I can see from heating and cooling strategy from cities across Europe is that uh, well district heating uh, is uh, favored more in dense urban area um and more like um, heat pump for example is more favored in a uh, less dense area uh, in the suburb of the city because it's uh, less uh, cost uh, efficient to to deploy district heating there so we need both but it depends also on the on the urban factors 
maybe we can go with the last question and then move to the next presentation. Magdalena, uh, there is one question mm -hmm. about the lifespan of the solar thermal panel. Uh, yes, um, we count with around uh, 20 to 30 years, which can be reached by solar thermal. And uh, we know from, from different uh, research projects that um, uh, the um, the output or, or the performance of the collectors are, are not going down within this um, within this time. Okay. So that's a very Great. efficient technology. Thank you very much for your presentation and, and your answer. Uh, we'll move to the next presentation from Daniel from Plant Energy, more on the technical side of the of the plants. Maybe. Yes, thank you. I will just share my screen now. Should be coming up in a second. There we go. So um, thank you for the invitation and I will present um, about how to integrate solar heat into your existing distributing grid. Uh, this presentation has developed together with my colleague uh, Geoffroy Cotier. And my name is Daniel Trier. So um, very briefly on the uh, historical uh, development in Denmark. Um, a few decades ago, we didn't see a lot of solar digital heating, but uh, as you can see here, uh, between 2010 and 2020, we saw a lot of uh, things happening. Um, you can also see it in, in a slide like this, where there's a big increase in 2016 uh, due to an end of a subsidy scheme uh, by the end of the year to 2016. That's meant that a lot of uh, plants uh, had a rush to to install solar thermal if they are if they were in the uh, considerations whether or not then uh, they they rushed to finalize to get a, a substantial subsidy. Um, a similar thing uh, were in, uh, implemented in 2019, also ending by the end of the year. So we saw a, a jump there again. So this uh, incentives, they provided sort of a stop and go uh, effect, as you have seen in, in other incentive schemes. In any way, uh, any case, um, we see a huge development and uh, around 1.6 million square meters are in operation today. So what happened and how uh, how was this uh, possible? Well, as mentioned, uh, a heat savings credit scheme was um, implemented. Also, uh, the feasibility of solar uh, thermal is often uh, raising the question, what is the alternative and what does that cost? And in Denmark, we had only limited um, availability for, for using biomass boilers in, in the decentralized digital heating plants. Uh, then a lot of them used gas boilers or gas engines, and um, that resulted in a very feasible solution with solar thermal to cover the summer demand. Uh, recently, we've seen a lot of heat pumps um, being implemented in distributing schemes in uh, distributing plants in Denmark. Uh, we have financial support for the investment, lower taxes for the electricity, and um, now that a lot of systems are implemented, uh, it's also becoming a more mature solution. But I will not use uh, the most, most of the time now to, to discuss the policies. Uh, maybe uh, a general thing about how does it look in Denmark? Well, these uh, ranges are not uh, limits, so we also see examples beyond these ranges, but this is just sort of the average system. Um, often flat plate collectors are used in the range of 5,000 to 20,000 square meters. Um, the annual yield is between roughly 400 to 500 kilowatt hours per square meter. And it covers uh, around 20% of the annual district demand, what we also call solar fraction or solar heat share. Um, the reason for the 20% is that actually if you cover 20% of the annual demand, that corresponds to covering everything during the summertime. And what can be mentioned in that perspective is that um, if you have the flat plate collectors, you cannot shut, shut them off. 
um, if you in, oversize the system and, and make it a bit too big, then you have to be able to uh, blow off some extra heat in summer because you can't just uh, shut them off. Um, in some cases, it's actually feasible to, to make it a bit uh, bigger. You can cover 30% of the annual demand um, with uh, short-term storage, but then you need uh, active cooling in, in summer to avoid uh, boiling of the system. But in some cases, it's actually feasible, even though most district heating operators, they, they don't like the idea of blowing off heat in the midsummer. But that might be a solution to cover more of the spring and autumn uh, heat demand with the solar. Seasonal storages are, of course, also an option to, to cover larger shares. I'll come back to that. Um, another point to mention is that if you have tracking collectors, another solution, then that is one way to, to actually shut off solar heat if you have too much in, in midsummer. Um, the, the reason to have flat pack collectors often in Denmark is that we don't have the big need for high temperatures in the distributing network. Mostly temperatures of 80 to 90 degrees is, is plenty or sufficient for the district heating networks so that you can supply the heat directly. And for those temperature levels, you don't necessarily need uh, concentrating collectors. Um, what is uh, important in terms of the uh, financing is that uh, we've had for a long time the option of providing muni municipality guaranteed loans, meaning that um, the district heating company, which might be owned by the municipality or by the public, um, is actually granted uh, a loan with very low interest rates and the ability to pay it off over several years. That long uh, payback time, uh, so that you split up the, the loan over several years, that means that the, the cost of solar heat more or less uh, corresponds to the capex cost of the loan, because the operating costs of solar thermal is very low. In the end, that results in a very low cost for solar heat in general. One other point to mention is that uh, it's often possible to locate the solar collective field uh, in Denmark uh, very close to the to the city or the town because we would have some farmland available in the outskirts of the town. But in general, I would say it's all, always interesting to look a bit further away than you might think is relevant because the cost of the transmission line to connect a district heating grid to a solar collective field is not a big percentage of the overall costs. So it might be interesting to look a bit further away, accepting a, a bit of extra cost for the transmission line. If land availability is an option, uh, is, an, is an issue. And as mentioned here, uh, it often has replaced natural gas and CHP uh, systems. And it has also, um, provided the, the option of, of stable prices and renewable heat. And uh, we all know that stable prices is something uh, becoming more and more interesting. We've seen recently that the uh, costs of heat or electricity based on natural gas can be uh, extremely volatile uh, with uh, geopolitical uh, things happening. So the resilience of, uh, of the heat price might be very important these days. So I mentioned flat plate collectors, but a range of options are available. And especially if you, you require higher temperatures, uh, then other options than the flat plate solutions might be interesting. In this, uh, in this chart, I've shown a bit of different options. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see the higher temperature levels, whereas the, the flat plate on the left-hand side is, is uh, only suitable for the lower temperatures up to 90, maybe 100 degrees maximum. So in Denmark, the most uh, most systems are relatively simple and for lower solar fractions. But you could also consider uh, larger solar fractions covering 
40, 50, or even more uh, of the annual demand. In that case, you would need a seasonal storage. Um, the picture here is from the construction phase where it's being filled up with water, and then in the end, you put a floating lid on top, insulated. And then that is a relatively cheap way of uh, large scale thermal storages. If you want to combine uh, two options, that is also a possibility. In the upper picture, you have flatbed collectors providing the first temperature lift, and then it, it's connected in series with parabolic trough collectors, which can then at the end supply high temperature uh, output. So a hybrid solution with different uh, solar collector technologies is also an option. We have a couple of examples with the personnel lenses uh, to access tracking also in Denmark installed. So the general uh, typical solution could look like this. We have an example here of 16,000 square meters of solar collectors, 3,600 cubic meters of water, providing a ratio between the volume and the collector area of uh, 0.2-ish. The solar fraction is 21% and the different other options are uh, gas CHP, gas boilers and an electric boiler. So that is a very typical Danish solar district heating system. As you can see in this uh, picture from, from that exact plant is the district heating plant is located in the outskirts of the town and we have fa farmland next to it. So it's uh, relatively easy to, to find a place for the collectors. So in terms of the uh, construction, this is just a principal sketch. Um, in this example, you have uh, two storage tanks. Maybe you have one next to the distributing plant and one next to the, the solar collectors, or you have a distributing plant in another place uh, in the town, not, um, well, put in other words, you might split up your distributing plant in two or three, across the town and uh, in this case you have two tanks places uh, located not uh, next to each other you might want to have the ability to send heat from one tank to the other so that you can put them in series and in this case um, you could indicate this by by the piping uh, system set up here you could send heat from the top of the this tank using the pump here uh, of, to the other tank. The cold water is then sent to the bottom by the pump here. The reason for this uh, valve setup uh, is actually that you might want to send the, the, the heat the other way around. So in this case, you would send heat here from this way. You put uh, you close the valves here and there so that the, the water's, water flow is going like this. Oh, sorry, I need to, sorry, I, I had a, a pointer in the other chart. Yeah, it's good now. Thanks. So, uh, so if you want to send heat from from this tank, you can use the pump here. You close the upper and lower valve, and then you just send the heat from one tank to the other. The colder water you send the other way around to the bottom. But you might want to uh, reverse the flow, and in this case, you would send it from the bottom and then send it in this direction instead. So you can use the same pump to reverse the flow. And the same thing with a hot pipe. I don't have to go into details. You can ask questions if you want later. Or I can explain in, a, in an email if you want. But the point about this is that you should consider how the system should operate uh, together with the other units, because that uh, might be uh, very uh, valuable when you um, end up with your system, how does it operate together with the rest of the system? What kind of flexibility do we want? We mentioned functional tender before, and what is important there is that you need to explain what do we want the system to be able to do. And with the functional tender, when you explain, I want it to be able to send heat from one tank to the other and uh, both ways, uh, then you could have the supplier offering a solution, for example, like this, and discuss the different solutions that they could come up with uh, before the, the, the contract is signed. 
Okay, a quick uh, other example is in uh, Pasta, also in Denmark. Um, in this case, we have um, an annual demand of 24 gigawatt hours per year. And in this case, they actually installed a solar collective field together with a heat pump at the same time. Um, both technologies benefit from a lower temperature, supplying a low temperature. Um, and in this case, we made sure that there are several options to to have the, the two technologies working together to, uh, to optimize the overall system. And the reason for having not only one technology, but several is that that gives you some resilience, meaning that, for example, in this case, you are uh, the, the distributing company is less relying on the electricity price because some of the demand is covered by solar thermal, where you, you are not depending on the electricity price. So uh, if you only relied mainly on the heat pump, then your heat price might be fluctuating due to the difference in, in electricity prices from one year to another. So the solar collector system makes it more resilient, um, providing a more stable heat price in general. I just checked today, um, they are not running their heat pump, they are uh, covering everything with solar thermal right now in this period. Well, they will probably do so most of the summer and then in the autumn, you can have a mix and in the winter, uh, mainly the heat pump, maybe in the midwinter supplied with uh, some, some extra wood, uh, wood pellet um, operation. So uh, this is just a few pictures of, of the system. You see the collectors, uh, one extra storage tank, a new technical building and the heat pump. That was part of a project uh, commissioned not too long ago. And the original storage tank and the original building, with the, the gas boilers um, is seen here. So uh, as a final remark, uh, there's a huge potential for solar district heating across Europe. And even though we've seen a lot of examples being installed in Denmark, it's not like we have uh, a huge amount of solar uh, irradiation. As you can see, we don't have better conditions than, than other countries. So I would say across Europe, but also across the world is, is really a good option for uh, expanding solar thermal. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for this presentation. Uh, there is already uh, one question um, about general recommendation uh, to install solar thermal with seasonal storage compared with solar thermal plus storage plus heat pump. Uh, but maybe you kind of answer with your last uh, example presented. Uh, I would say it, it depends on the circumstances and the, the, the solution. If you want to go for a, as I understand the question, you ask if you want to, you should go for a higher share of solar, uh, solar fraction with a seasonal storage or a lower solar fraction than combining with a heat pump. And Yaka, Yaka, maybe can you can you unmute yourself if you have a microphone? Just explain a bit more your question, so that Daniel can better answer. Of course. Um, no, my question is uh, about uh, general recommendations. So also not only uh, let's say technical part, but also financial part. Uh, so if we have uh, have uh, have some distribution heating and we are thinking about uh, adding some uh, thermal thermal uh, solar power power plant uh, what on the what what would be let's say a recommendation to go uh, only with uh, seasonal solar thermal with seasonal uh, I think your your microphone was cut, but anyway, I, I think I understood your your question. Um, I would say often you need to consider what is the overall cost for to to cover the entire demand, 
And if you have a seasonal storage, you need to be aware what uh, what solution should cover the rest in any case. Um, so actually, the the optimal solution might be a seasonal storage and a heat pump to to add to that. Um, we also see uh, an example in Denmark where you actually have large solar fraction uh, with the seasonal storage and uh, an air source heat pump in combination with that. And the air source heat pump is, is both able to uh, extract heat from the air and extract heat from the storage as well. And um, that gives the ability to sort of utilize the storage volume a bit more. Um, a bigger delta T of the storage uh, results in and a higher uh, storage capacity with the same volume. So um, a mix might be in, in order, but in general, I'd say it's very difficult to say one solution fits all. Uh, it's often worthwhile before investing millions of euros uh, to, to analyze a bit what kind of solutions are relevant and how does the feasibility look in, in each scenario. It, it doesn't take too much uh, effort to to narrow down the the relevant solutions, but it, it's very dependent on uh, electricity costs, uh, fuel costs, and taxes, and and so on. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, are there other questions? Maybe raise your hand or ask in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, maybe I can I have one question. Uh, you mentioned a tracking system for the solar panel. Can you uh, maybe tell us how much more expensive uh, panels with tracking are, are compared to the normal one? Um, I don't have to, uh, to, a lot of numbers for, for the cost of tracking. Okay. Uh, I can only say that um at least historically we, we haven't seen too many examples of that in denmark um if you don't need the higher temperatures it might be cheaper to have a, a more simple solution with a fixed setup and, and and that's it um but that's again due to the conditions in, in denmark maybe because if you have tracking you might get a certain percentage of extra uh, yield, and if the if the yield in Denmark gives if you get x, x percent extra um, from a yield in Denmark, that might not be feasible. But the same x percent in southern France is a bigger uh, number in absolute uh, absolute numbers, mm -hmm. so that might be feasible feasible there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I don't see any more question uh, in the chat, so thanks a lot, Daniel. Let's.